from Oasis of Faith Christian Center in Hesperia, California. Welcome to the Oasis of Faith with pastor and teacher, Daryl Harrelson. Welcome to the Oasis of Faith. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you would please, this morning to the book of James, James chapter 1. And as you're turning there, if you would please say this after me. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, today we're going to continue on in our teaching. We've been teaching on the subject of the laws of faith and confession, or the law of faith and confession. Last week we finished off talking about the fact that you and I, following law number one, as you know, and I don't have time to go back and reteach all this, okay, but the first law that we started looking at was that we have to guard our mouths and our minds. And we left off, I believe, in Ecclesiastes, and we looked at Ephesians chapter 4 when he said, let no com- corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, and we explained that. And then in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, in verses 2 and 3, where the last part of the third verse, it says that just as being too busy gives you nightmares, being a fool makes you a blabbermouth. Okay, and we read that from the New Living Translation. All right. So this is where we're going to take off today because we're still dealing with this first law, which is to guard our mouths and our minds, okay? Now, like I told you in closing that too many Christians talk themselves right out of the blessings of God. And uh, and they don't realize it a lot of times, but they talk themselves out of it. And if you're not careful, because we have to guard our mouth and our mind, the devil will attack you in your mind. That's your thought life. So you've got to guard your mind. And he, if you let him, he'll talk you out of the blessings of God. He'll talk you out of what God has given you and what God has already paid the price for to give you. He'll plant those thoughts in your mind and he'll talk you out of it. And then the worst part of all is once he plants those thoughts in your mind... He gets you to speak it with your mouth. And now you got not only your mind working against you, you got your mouth working against you. And I told you, remember, if you remember this, your mouth and your head are hooked together. So if your thinking is messed up, your mouth is going to be messed up. Amen? All right, you ready? All right, did I, t- I told you James chapter 1. All right, we got to hurry. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 22. Now, you all know this. I'm not, what I'm sharing with you this morning, if you've been around this church any length of time, these are not new verses. These, these are verses that we've talked about for years. We study this and we look at it. But this is something that I really don't believe has sunk into the hearts of a lot of people. Because once it does, your life will change. James says in verse 22, But be you doers of what? The word. The word. Did he say, be, be talkers of the word? No. Did he say, be uh, thinkers of the word? No. no, he said to be doers of the word. Uh-huh. Now, it'd be a good, good thing to talk the word, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's good to be a hearer of the word. But he didn't stop there. He said that we're to be doers of the word. Amen? Yeah. He said, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And that's where the church, if we're not careful, we can get into trouble. If we're not going to do the word, and this is, and, and, and I don't know how many times in my life, my Christian life, where I've heard people tell me, and they're facing situations in their life or troubles in their life, maybe in their marriage or what have you. And, um, and more, often, more often than not, I have wives that come in and uh, they want to talk, you know, they want counseling session because they're having problems with their husbands and, and this and that. So finally, I, 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 I've made it a plan now, I've made it a, a policy now that if, if you want to talk to me about your marriage problems, then you both come in. That's right. That's right. Because I'm only hearing one side. Right. 
And so they come in and they say, well, my husband doesn't do this, and my husband doesn't do that, and on and on and on and on and on. I said, oh, okay, so he's not a doer of the word. Oh, he knows the word. I said, stop. Oh, that irritates me. Oh, no, he knows the word. No, he doesn't. Oh, he can quote. I said, I don't care if he can quote it from Genesis to Revelation. He doesn't know the word. Right. Well, what do you mean? If he's not doing it, he doesn't know it. That's right. That's right. It's only the word that you know is what you're going to do. I can go out to the pet store and I can get a bird, buy a beautiful cage and put that thing in the cage. And I mean, put, forget the newspaper. I can put nice wrapping paper in it and make, I mean, just doll that thing up where it looks like a million bucks. Put that bird in that cage. Teach that bird to talk. And I can teach that bird to quote the scripture. Right? But just because he can quote the scripture doesn't mean they're doers of the word. And that's what a lot of Christians have become. They become talking birds. Because they can tell you what so-and-so said. And I can tell you what brother so-and-so said. But they can't tell you what Jesus said. That's where you get in trouble. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? You remember years ago there was a fad that came out called WWJD. Remember that? What would Jesus do? What would you, everybody, what would Jesus do? Well, that was a big mistake. See, that's one thing. I don't get hung up in Christian cliches. A lot of Christians do. Man, something new come out, they put it on a t-shirt and a coffee cup, and people just run and grab it, man. The coffee cup's not going to change your life. The t-shirt's not going to change your life. What would Jesus do? It's not what Jesus would do. The question is, what did Jesus do? That's what you got to ask. What did Jesus, how did he respond? Not what would Jesus do, what did he do? But it sounded good, so everybody, man, they got, they got them rubber, what do they call them rubber band bracelets? What do they call them? Is there a name for them? And they got them on, WWJD, WWJD. WWJD, everything WWJD, you know. Well, it's not about what he would do. What did he do? Jesus didn't play around. He was about the Father's business. Amen? Why? Because Jesus was a doer of the word. James said, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Why? What's the next phrase? He said, if you hear the word and don't do it, you are self-deceived. I wonder how many self-deceived Christians we have in the body of Christ. That's why, Teresa, that's why you bless me. Because, just because, now, now I get it, we have guest speakers that come here, I get that. And we, you know, we invite the whole community to come, okay? But that's why I don't get hung up in guest speakers. I, I enjoy them, don't get me wrong, I enjoy them, and I thank God for them, but my life doesn't revolve around the guest speaker. My life revolves around the Word of God because yeah. it's final authority. They, don't, don't they use the same Bible you do? Yeah. He said, be doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving their own selves. And a lot of times Christians, watch this, and you, and, you, and you correct me. I'll give you permission to correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of times Christians will hear a big name speaker say something Okay? And so and so said this, and it sounds great, and it, and it probably is, but that's the only time they'll, they'll hear them. Right. That one time. But, you know, but they never implement what they heard. That's right. It's fine if what you heard is lined up with the word, but are you implementing what they said? That's right. And what we've become, and I just hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. If we're not careful, we become name droppers. We become name droppers. Because we want everybody to think, that's my hero. Hey, no one, I'll just say this. No one loved, loved Dr. Price the way I did. Well, I did. Okay, maybe you did. But no one loved Dr. Price the way I did. I, re- I love Dr. Price. I mean, he, God used the man to change my life. But he was a man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
He's a human being, just like I'm a human being, you're a human being. Right? You love Dr. Price. Right? But people are humans. So James said to be doers of the word and not just hearers of it, deceiving our own selves. So if we're not careful, we can become self-deceived. Isn't that right? He says, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, or he's looking into the mirror. Now, this is the mirror right here, the word of God. This is the mirror. So when you go to the word of God and you see what the word of God says, you with me? This man he's talking about is a man that goes to the Word of God. He sees himself in the Word. He sees what the Word says about him. Then he closes the Bible and then he forgets what he read about himself. He forgets who he is in Christ. Why? Because he's a hearer of the Word and not a doer of the Word. Or she. He or she. All right. Verse 24. For he sees himself and goes his way and immediately forgets what manner of man he was or what manner of man he saw in the Word. So, the truth here is, that I want to show you, is you really need, now watch, that you, <laughs> you really don't listen to yourself. What am I saying? People really don't listen to themselves when they say things. Let me prove it to you. Okay? Let me ask you this question. How long is your nose? Does anybody know how long their nose is? Huh? Have you ever taken the time to measure your nose? You never have? Hmm? I learned this years ago. My nose is roughly two inches long. From, from the bridge right here, to rough, roughly between an inch and three quarters and two inches long. Okay? Now, how do I know that? Because I measured it. You have a measuring stick at your disposal. It's called the Word of God. So, you take your words that you speak now, and you measure them next to the Word of God. And if your words aren't measuring up to the Bible, that's a clear sign you shouldn't be saying it. Am I making sense? Well, thank you for those three amens. I'm not trying to step on your toes. I'm trying to help you. Huh? No, really. Because all you can do is go by what the Bible says you are. Most Christians are not confident in themselves. They're cocky. They're arrogant. They're boastful. But they're not confident. Well, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. No, hang on to it. You need it. See, that's, that's not confidence, that's arrogance. That's arrogance. God doesn't want us to be arrogant. He wants us to be confident in His Word. Amen? So now, once you begin to line those words up against the Word of God, you measure them with the Word of God, once you do that, you begin or you become prone to be careful about the words you speak. You'll, 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 remember what David said? He said, put a guard on my mouth. Keep the, lip, keep the door to my lips. Remember that? So now, remember I told you that God's putting that back in our court. That's something we have to do. God's not going to do it for you. Now, one thing that I've learned, you know, the Bible tells us that iron, what does iron do? But not in church. Well, what does that mean? If iron sharpens iron, okay, that means you and I are both iron, Right? And we can keep each other sharp, but not in church. Because you just do something wrong in church and you have somebody correct you a little bit and you get your feelings hurt. See, as long as I'm doing the sharpening, I'm okay. But don't you sharpen me. That's right. That's right. I know what I'm talking about, Paul. That's how we are in church. Yeah. Oh, I, I, had people, I had people come to me, I don't know how many times. Well, so-and-so me told me I need to do this, and I need to do that, and I need to do this. Well, what happened? Well, I got my feelings hurt. See, so you can't go around telling everybody, number one, you can't go around telling people your problems if you don't want them to tell you how to fix it. 
If you're not gonna, if you're not gonna take the word to fix the problem, then the best thing to do is just keep your mouth closed and quit telling everybody about your problems. But see, most people don't really want to tell you about their problems that get fixed. They just want to vent. Because they don't really want the answer to fix it. They just want you to listen to them. My wife told me, she said, man, I don't know how you do it. She said, you, you, she said, you're the best listener I have ever met in my life. She said, you just listen and listen and listen and listen and listen and listen. Well, I do, but I learned that from Brother Hagin years ago. Because Brother Hagin, and I, and I, and I, I, I must admit, I, I can get my button pushed, and, you know, and I, had, I can let it out as much as I can listen. But um, Brother Hagin, he used to go out with, with, with people you know, after he'd minister and stuff, and they might go to a restaurant and sit down. And so Brother Hagin would sit there, and the people would say, Brother Hagin, how come, how come you're not joining in the conversation? And he says, well, I already know what I know. And he said, well, what does that have to do with it? He goes, I want to find out what you know or what you think you know or what you don't know. He said, I already know what I know. But have you ever noticed, and I don't know if it comes with age. Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't deal with it. But people will tell you things. And if there's a, if there's a, a specific thing that they, they, they like to talk about, they'll tell it again and again and again and again. And you, hey, well, you, know, you already told me that 17 times. But, right. right. You know, I already, you know, but you forgot you told me 17 times. But, but you know what I do? I just sit there and go. Yeah, right. Because I know where they're going with it. Yeah. Right. But evidently they like to talk about that. But my thing is, can we talk about the Word? All right. Can we talk about what the Word says? That's right. That's the key. Are you with me? So remember this. Negative thoughts are conceived in the mind. Write that down. Negative thoughts are conceived in your mind. But they should never come out of your mouth. And remember we talked about the thoughts? Even Jesus had thoughts. Negative thoughts are conceived in the mind, but they should never come out of your mouth. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs 4. Now, and like I said, negative thoughts come to all of us. I mean, if you're, if you're alive and you're breathing and you're a normal human being, then negative thoughts are going to come. They come to all of us, okay? But what are you going to do with those thoughts when they come? That's what you have to ask yourself. Proverbs 4. Are you there? All right. Proverbs chapter 4. Look at verse 23. Look what, look what the Proverbs says here in verse 23. It says, keep your what? Keep your heart. That's your spirit. Keep your heart with what? All diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of what? One translation says, out of it are the forces of life. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this question. He said, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it, the heart, come the issues of life. Right? So let me ask you this. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, that out of the abundance of the heart? Didn't he say that? Yes. Okay. So here he's telling us that we need to keep our hearts with all diligence. Or we could just say it this way, with discipline. See, I know some Christians who never discipline their mind. Their mind, their mind just runs wild. And they, sure enough, because their mind runs wild, they never discipline their, their mouth. So what is it, whatever's in there, it's just going to come out. Or I, let me ask you this. Have you ever heard somebody say, they'll say something, they'll say, whoops, I didn't mean that. No, you did. You did. Why? Because it was in the heart, in abundance. Whatever is in that heart, in your, in your spirit, it's eventually it's going to come out of your mouth. Why? Because you've got enough seed down there in, in there for it to where eventually the harvest is going to come out. That's why I get, a, I get a kick out of people in church. I love church people. I do. You know, especially during praise and worship time. My heart goes out to you pray. Man, I'm glad I'm not on the praise team anymore. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm telling you, they, they work so hard to lead you into the presence of God, and they rehearse, and they practice, 
and, and, and they do that, and they get up there, and they're pouring their hearts out, you know, and just, you know, standing up here, you know, trying to get you to lift your hands and lift your voices and sing to the Lord and praise Him for His goodness, and some of you just sitting there like, right? Right? Yep. How about this? Well, how come you're not praising God? Well, pastor, I just have a praise in my heart. I'm not a very vocal person, but I've got a praise in my heart. Now you lied. Why? Because if you've got a praise in your heart, it's going to come out of your mouth. So if it's not coming out, there's no praise in there. I didn't write the Bible. I didn't write it. Don't get mad at me and throw rocks. I didn't write it. I'm trying to help you. Well, you just don't understand. I'm just... I just, you know, I just like to do it my own way. Well, okay. But you're still not praising God. You do it any way you want, but you're still not praising God. So, he says out of the issues of life, they come out of the heart. So we need to guard your heart. Guard, say, guard my heart. Guard my heart. And allow only those things into my heart that are consistent with God's plan, God's plan and purpose, and purpose for, my life. for my life. So now, when you do that, here's what happens. If you'll do that, then you will bring God on the scene of your circumstance and His presence will show up. That's right. That's right. See, go back to praise for a moment. If you really have praise in your heart, you'll begin to open your mouth and sing the praises of God. Yes. Right? right? Yes. Because it's in there. Yes. Well, to back up what I just said, in the book of Psalms, the Bible says that God inhabits the what? He inhabits the praises of his people. Well, what does that mean? He shows up. If you're, if, 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 if you're in the middle of a battle or a situation, a negative situation in your life, that's not the time to roll over and play dead. That's the time right in the middle of adversity. To begin to write, I mean, just right in the middle of your bedroom, stand on your feet and begin to praise God. Father, I just want to praise you and thank you. I don't care what the doctor said. I don't care what the report is. I want to praise you and thank you. Why? Because when you do that, you bring God on the presence of your circumstance right then. And I need God in the presence of my circumstance. Me having a pity party is not going to do me any good. It's not going to do you any good. It's not going to do it. So I got to get that praise coming out of me. I got to get it out. Lord, Lord, I just want to, I just want to. Some, some of you, I know, I know you think I'm crazy, but it's okay. I, I can't help it. I, I just have to stop and say, Lord, I just want to. I don't know why you're, I, I don't know why you're so good to me. That's right. That's right. I just don't know why. There are times in my life, and I shared this the other day, and I don't like to talk about it, but there are times in my life and I'm just being honest with you. Almost every day, I feel so inadequate. I don't know why God chose me. I don't know why God called me. I don't know why. I'm nothing. I'm nobody special. I know I tell you you're special, and you are. But who am I? No, but... but but I, but I look up, you know, I was, we're, we're out in the backyard and, and, and looking up into the sky at the stars. And, and I look up there and there, that one star I was telling you about that twinkles at me. When I go out there and I look up in the, and it twinkles at me. And I think, man, that looks like God's eye winking at me. And then I think, but God, why me? Who am I? I, I, I I'm, not, I'm not anybody. I'm not anything. I'm, I'm, I'm a human being, Don. You know that. Do I have flaws? A, few. a lot of them, huh? <laughs> but I, I just sometimes I just feel so inadequate. And, and, I, and then I begin to question myself and I say, God, what can I do? God, what can I do? God, I want to do more. Tell me what I can do. God, just, and the Lord, the Lord he's just so loving. He goes, yes, he you can't do, yes. can't do anything. He said, I love you because I love you. He said, now you just obey me. He goes, that's, that's all I want you to do is just obey me. But it's not about doing things. It's about just obeying his word. Amen. 
And one of the things to obeying his word is speaking what he says. That's right. That's right. Just saying what he says. That's all. Do you know me? Can I just be honest with you this morning? No, really. Can I be honest? You won't get your feelings hurt? Nobody cares about your problems. That's right. It's true. So true. It's true. No. That's so true. That's so true. But I just got to tell somebody about my problem. Nobody cares. I'm not trying to be mean. No, honestly, I, I, trust me, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm, I, no. But you know what? People got enough problems of their own. No, that's right. That's right. <laughs> right? That's right. Yep. Am I making sense? But I just got to tell something. No, you don't have to tell anybody. That's why 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all of your cares, all of your concerns, all of your worries. Cast them all over on the Lord. Why? Because He cares. He cares for you. He cares for you. And when I say, listen, listen, let me, let me, when I say people don't care, some really don't care. But it's not that they don't care. It's just that your, your problems, your concerns are not as important to them as their, as their own. Are you with me? They, they got enough on their plate. They don't need to eat yours too. And they really don't want it. Because they like meatloaf and you got liver and they don't want your liver. Right. Still with me? Yeah. So when you do this, you bring God's presence in on the scene of your circumstances. Just begin to praise him right there in the yeah. middle. Yeah. Let the, let the, you know what I, you know, I remember years ago when I was a baby Christian, I didn't know how to praise God. Because I was new in the Baptist church. They didn't tell us anything about praising God. I mean, the closest we ever got to praising God was, Amen. Amen. If you agreed with the preacher. Amen. That was, I mean, it didn't raise your hands. Not in the Baptist church. You don't raise your hands. Amen. <laughs> we never said hallelujah. Which is really the, in any language, it's the highest praise you can offer. It's the highest praise. So when I was in the Bible, and, I, and I, would, I would read and study my Bible, I started saying hallelujah. Well, people looked at me like I was weird. Hallelujah. Well, why, well, hallelujah. Now you're getting religious on it, you know. <laughs> so I looked up the word hallelujah, and that's where I learned that in any language on the planet, it's the highest form of praise yeah. that you can give to God. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's, all, it's the same in all languages. Yeah. Are you with me? So I began to praise him and say, Lord, I just want to thank you. And then, I, so now I want to find out, because then I started hearing terms after I left the Baptist church and started running with the Pentecostal church. And uh, I started hearing terms like praise and worship. Well, I didn't know what the difference was. So what, do, you mean there's a difference? The church today still doesn't know there's a difference. And it's not the same. See, praise... Praise is, is telling God how much you thank Him for what He's done. You, you appreciate what He's done for you. But now worship takes you to a whole different level. Worship is just praising Him, ready? Just for who He is. You're not asking Him for anything. Nothing. You're just, you're just thanking Him and extolling Him for who He is. He is God. Are you with me? That's, what, that's the difference between praise and worship. So you have to, you start looking at these things. And see, I, 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 I now this is me, I enjoy worship. Amen. No, I enjoy worship. Amen. But here again, most churches don't even know what worship is. They don't even know what praise is. All they know is, in the Baptist church, we call it a song service. But there was no praise and worship in the song service. They just sang a song out of the hymn. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. Well, how's he going to pass me when he said he'd never leave me nor forsake me? You see what I'm saying? There's no praise and worship involved. See, you don't have to have music and song to praise and worship. It comes from the heart. 
comes out of there. You see? So before it can come out, it's got to be put in. Nothing coming out, there's been nothing put in. Are you with me? So when you do what I just told you to do, then you bring God on the presence of you and the scene of your circumstances. And, you know, like the song says, if God be for us, who can be successful against us? You with me? So remember, each one of us has a responsibility for our own lives. Write that down. That is your heavy revy for the day. Each one of us is responsible for our own lives. God doesn't make you responsible for anybody else's life, and He's not making them responsible for your life. Each one of us is responsible for our own own life, your own words, whatever you put into your heart that's going to come out of your mouth. You're responsible for what you put in. So let me say this. No word in, no word out. That's how it works. Look at, are you still in Proverbs? Flip over to the 30th, uh, 30th chapter of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 30, and look what it says here. Thank you, Lord. Proverbs chapter 30, and look at verse 32. Proverbs 30, verse 32. It says, If you have done foolishly in lifting up yourself, or if you have thought evil, underline that in your Bible, lay your hand upon your what? Mouth. Mouth. Now, did you catch that? Notice, notice, notice the two parts in there. If you have done foolishly in lifting up yourself, or if you have thought evil. Do you see the thought? What do you do? Put your hand over your mouth. Why? Why? So it doesn't come out. Don't let those thoughts come out of the mouth. Why? Why? Brother Hagin used to say this, and I'm just quoting what he said. He said, a thought, un- or excuse me, if the, if the thought never comes out of words, the thought will die unborn. If you never speak it out, the thought will die unborn. Why? Because words give life to it. Words give, I mean, words give life to your thoughts. See, take, take sin for instance. See, the, 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 the sin is not the thought. The sin is acting upon the thought. Amen. See, like I said last week, and I'll say it again, but because we were taught wrong right. as children growing up, you heard it like I heard it, that it's just as bad to think something as it is to say it. Right? right? No, it's not. Because right. you can't stop the thoughts. That's right. They're going to come. Yeah. You're not exempt from thoughts. Yeah. But you don't have to say what comes in your head. That's right. That's right. You don't have to say that. That's right. Just like the man this morning in the parking lot. You know, he, he wanted to give me a piece of his mind. Because well, I guess one of our ushers upset him. And, so he, and man, the, the, the profanity just rolled out at me. Wow. And, and you don't, don't want to know what he called everybody in here. Oh my and your mama. But I, I calmed him down real nice. And I said, well, I hate to see you leave. I said, come on back in. No, I'm not going in there. Most unloving people I've ever met in my life. So wait a minute. You didn't meet everybody. You had an encounter with one person, and now you're judging everybody the same. Now, you don't want to, we want to try to help people. We're trying to do that. But he's judging everybody. And I thought, my goodness, you going to church, you really need to be. If, if anybody needs to be here today, you need to be in here today. We get you delivered from that filth. I mean, he had a horrible mouth. Did you hear him, Paul? Oh, man, he was, man, he unloaded on me. Now, if I would have been unsaved, no, forget being saved or not. If I would have punched him, I'd have probably killed him with one punch, but I, didn't, right. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I'm, God's delivered me from that, okay? Yeah. All right. All right, where am I at? So 
like I said, if you have the thought, he says, lay hold on your mouth. He didn't say, if you have said, he said, if you have thought. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. So he said, lay, hand on your, lay hold or put, a, put your hand on your mouth. Why? Because words, write this down, words are seeds. Words are seeds. So if those seeds, now watch, if those seeds never get planted, they'll never produce the harvest in your life. See, one thing about seed is, is, is you have to understand. You could have a 55-gallon drum of corn seed, let's say, in your garage. Okay? And I come over to your house and you say, hey, look at this drum. I got 55 gallon drum full of corn seed. Isn't that awesome? Oh yeah, that's wonderful. But that corn seed's not going to do you any good until it's planted. The same thing is with seeds, with words, spoken words. They're seeds. So if you never plant them, there's never going to be a harvest. So whatever seed you plant, that's what you will harvest. Well, I just don't know why anybody... I had a person tell me this in church years ago. I just don't know why nobody loves me. I said, well, why do you say that? Well, because no one ever speaks to me. I said, well, how many people did you speak to? None. Well, why not? Because nobody loves me. <laughs> See, and, and you can sit there and just go in a vicious circle over and over and over again. <coughs> Excuse me, but you're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. See? But if you want people to love you, you got to sow seeds of love. Amen. You have to sow seeds of love. Now, I realize not everybody is lovely. Is that, did I get a witness on that, Terry? Okay. Not everybody's lovely. But we still have to sow seeds of love. We have to do it. The Bible tells us to. Amen. Now, you can get to the point to where you don't, maybe you don't care whether people love you or not. But, you know, in all reality, everybody wants to be loved, right? I mean, don't we all want to be loved? Really. But if you want love, you've got to give it. It doesn't come. It's, it's kind of like respect. You don't get respect just because of who you are. You get respect by the way you treat people. If you don't treat people with respect, you're not going to get any respect. If you don't treat people with love, you're not going to get any love. Same thing. So if you don't have a kind word for a person, then no, chances are nobody's ever going to have a kind word for you. I mean, that's just the way it is. That, see, that's a law. That's called the law of sowing and reaping. You will reap your harvest regardless of who you are. You're going to reap it just the way it is. You still with me? So words are seeds. That's why he said here in Proverbs, we have to put our hand over our mouth. Hold it back. Don't let that thought come out of your mouth. See, and if you'll do that, now Satan has no access into your life except through the thought life. That's right. He can only plant the thoughts, but he can't make you say anything. That's something you do. So when he plants the thought and you give it life with your mouth, you get those words, or that thought, you give them words. Now you've set yourself in agreement with what the devil said. I was, when we were teaching on the word, the power of the word for healing on Wednesday night a few weeks back, and I was sharing this, that when the devil plants a thought in your mind about sickness and you, you, you think you're getting sick, all right, the moment that thought comes and you think I'm, t I'm taking the flu, and you say it, you took it. You, you, what did you do? You just agreed with the devil instead of God's word. But you already know this, right? No, you already know this. You all know this. Everybody knows this. Just ask it. Just ask the person sitting next to you. You already know this. Don't you? You already know this, right? You already know it, right? Don't you already know it? Then why do we do it? See, it goes back to the husband and wife. Oh, my husband knows the word. No, he might quote it, but he doesn't know it because if he knew it, he'd be doing it. You with me? Did you go home? I'm almost done. Bear with me. 
I'm trying to help you this morning. I'm just trying to help you. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 real quick. See, we want to keep Satan out. Don't give him any access to your, to your thought life. See, now Paul's going to tell us what we can do with the thought life. He's going to tell us here what we can do. And I don't know, but most Christians, I think, you know, the ones I talk to, that when, a, when a thought comes, they like to roll it around That's what they do. in their head. Yep. And they, they play it over. It's, it's like play, rewind, play, rewind, play, rewind, play, rewind. Over and over again, those thoughts. They just keep replaying them over and over and over and over. What do they call it? Um, there's a new term they use now. Loop, loop. That's the word, loop. They loop it. Okay. So, yeah, okay. I know you couldn't read my mind, but anyway. All right. But they loop it, and they just keep playing it over and over and over and over again, right? But look what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 3. Paul said, though we walk in the flesh. Now, how many of you know we walk in the flesh? Uh, you, got a, you got a physical body, you have a flesh body. He says, but we do not war after the flesh. Now, watch this. A lot of times we blame everything on the flesh. We'll say, oh, the flesh did this and the flesh did that. No, you let the flesh do it. Well, who's you? The spirit man, the real you. You let the flesh get away with it. You let the flesh do it. But your flesh will only do what you let it do. The same thing is true with your mind, with your thought life. If you just put that in there and you just keep looping it and playing it again and again and again and again, what are you doing? You're giving the devil a place in your head and not even charging him rent. It's the truth. And I better not say it. Well, I'll say it. Don't get mad at me, okay? But some of you, and I'm not mentioning anybody's name, just look straight ahead. Some of you have let the devil set up an entire playground in your head. You got the merry-go-round, you got the jungle gym, you got the bars, you got the swing set, you got everything in that playground. It's in there. And you've let the devil have full access to it. And you say, I just don't know why these thoughts won't stop. Anxiety is a thought. That's why the Bible says don't be anxious for anything. There's a cure for anxiety. Go to the Word. Mm. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For or because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now underline that in your Bible just for a minute. Because I, I want to I I hit a point here that I want you to grab hold of. How many times have you heard Christians make this statement? Well, you know, I did this because that's just a weakness I have. You ever heard that? You ever heard that? Scratch it. Christians don't have weaknesses. Not Christians. No. We have strongholds. And those strongholds need to have to be pulled down. Yes. Well, how do you pull them down? With the Word of God. Amen. Paul's going to show us how to do it right here, right now. Mm -hmm. But see, if you never get in the Word for yourself, yes. you're never going to find out how to pull these strongholds down. That's right. He said that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5, here it is. Casting down what? imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against another term for the knowledge of God is the word of God and bringing into captivity what every thought to the obedience of Christ or the word of God how do I do that I bring that thought down I submit it, I subject it to the Word of God, I measure it with the Word of God, that thought, right? I cast it down and bring it into line with the Word of God. So you ready? If it's not a good thought, you know it's not God. Now, 
let me just say this, even sometimes good thoughts, good thoughts are not God. That's right. Not all good thoughts are God. No, Someone said, Pastor, I have a good idea. Well, it may be a good idea, but is it a God idea? There are good ideas that God had nothing to do with. But is it a God idea? Well, you know, Pastor, I think we should do this. It's a good idea. Yeah, but is it a God idea? Well, how can I know? Have you prayed about it? Well, no. Then it's just an idea. I mean, God drops things into my spirit all the time, but before I act on them, I want to make sure I heard him. I want to make sure I'm doing what he said to do. Have I missed it? Doggone right I have. And I have paid the price for it. And I don't like missing God. I want to make sure that my, my, when God speaks to me, I'm doing what he wants me to do. But he said, casting down imaginations. Now watch this. The word imaginations in the original Greek, it means this. It means reasonings, thoughts, human reasonings, and human understanding. That's what it means. So now, where are you going to go to get the knowledge of God from? Where are you going to go? How about, let me ask you a question. What would you say if I told you you have the mind of Christ? What would you say if I told you you have the knowledge of God? What would you say, this will really mess you up, because you hear dumb preachers say this all the time. Well, you need the wisdom of God. The Bible says Christ has been made wisdom unto you. So if you have Christ, then you have the wisdom of God. Yeah, pastor, but the Bible says if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask. Well, the only reason you'd ask is because you think you don't have the wisdom. Am I right or wrong? That's the only reason a person would ask for something is if they thought they didn't have it. Christians do it all the time. Lord, I want more anointing. God, I want more power. God, I want more of your word. God says, okay, you want more anointing. Okay, let me see. Where can I get more anointing to give to him? I've already given him the anointing. You want more power? Oh, God's saying, okay, let me see if I can find some more power to give to him. God, give me more faith. God says, I've already given all the faith you need. I just want more of the word. God says, you got a Bible. How come God never speaks to me? You don't listen. I want God to speak to me. No, you want God to talk to you in an audible voice. You can't do that. If he wants to, he can. But you've got his word. He can talk to you every day. That's why I make people mad when I say this. God talks to me every day. Every day? Yeah, because I read his word every day. Every day he talks to me. So when I read the Bible, most of the time when I, when I, when I bless people with Bibles, I always, I normally, I haven't done it lately, but I used to, whenever I get somebody a Bible, I would write in the front of it. This is God's word speaking to you. And I would put it in there. It's God's word speaking to you. When I open the word, it's God's word speaking to me. See, I, I make it personal. It's mine. So the way we do this is we cast down these thoughts. Okay? We cast them down. We, we, we discipline our thought life. We cast it down or we throw it down. How? By seeing if it measures up, that thought, if it measures up to the Bible, to the Word of God. So be careful what you say and don't let anything out of your mouth that's contrary to the Word of God. Amen. Don't do it. Yeah, Pastor, but how do I know if it's contrary to the Word of God? You learn only going to know by spending time in the Word. Right. I've had people tell me, well, I just wish I knew the will of God. Well, His Word is His will. Or you'll hear people say, well, I, I prayed for this if it's God's will. That's stupid. Right. What do you mean? Open the Bible and find out if it's his will. If it's his will, pray for it. If it's not, don't pray for it. Amen. That's why I don't want to do something and then have to ask God to bless it. I'd rather pray about it, make sure it's the will of God, and then do it, and then I know it's blessed. Right. 
Yeah. Do you see that? Does that make sense? Yeah. See? Well, you know, but, but you know, I mean, after all, you know, God, I just want God's will. Well, get into the Word. Well, if I only knew the will of God. Well, now you just said you don't know what the Word says. Because if you got in the Word, you know what the will is. Yeah. Am I making sense? Yeah. Okay. I got to close here in just a minute. You still with you? Just get, get, give, me, get, give me another two minutes, okay? All right. Go to Romans chapter 12. Say, spending time in the Word. I can find out what the will of God is. What the will of God is. Romans chapter 12. Look at verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or your spiritual service. Now, question. Did you see that, what he said? He said, present your what? Your bodies. All right, question. Is your tongue and your mouth, are they a part of your body? They are? Okay. Then your spirit now, which is the real you, your spirit is, is supposed to Control your body. Now grab hold of this. Here's where a lot, of, a lot of Christians get in trouble because, see, your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect, and your desires. And your soul rides piggyback on your spirit. But your spirit, man, is to control your body and your soul. Your spirit man is too. That's why Paul said you, talking to the spirit man, present your body. He didn't say you present your spirit. He's addressing the flesh, but he says you, the spirit man, has to deal with the flesh. You're, like I said, your body and your head will do and say and think whatever you let it do, say and think. But see, you can't, you have control over it. Here's where Christians don't grab this. You ready? They don't realize they're in 100% control. And this is why so many Christians say, oh, God, help me with my flesh. No, come on. Just be honest now. Come on. Come on. We've all done it at one time in our dumb life, right? Come on, especially us people that are a little bit on the heavy side. Oh, God, you got to help me with my weight. And the Lord says, stop eating. No, he didn't say stop eating. He said, cut back. You don't need that much. Or start eating the right things. Or he might say, do some exercise. God, you got to help me. No, God says, you do it. Okay, now don't fall into that lie that a lot of people talk. Well, you know, God only helps those who help themselves. That's not biblical. It might be true in one aspect, but it's not biblical. Because God does help those, you know, who help themselves. But he still requires us to do it. Uh, there, I remember telling, there was a story about these guys that uh, they were in a boat. And uh, they got out on the lake and they were doing some fishing. And uh, all of a sudden the, the boat sprang a leak. And so water started getting in the boat. And so the one guy says, uh, grab a bucket. Help me get the water out. He says, no, I'm going to pray. He said, it's fine to pray. He says, but take a bucket and help get the water out till God can patch the hole. He didn't want to go down. And that's where a lot of Christians are. You know, they're waiting for God to do something. And they use the, they use the old Christian cliche. Well, I'm just waiting on God. I'm just waiting on God. Putting it over in God's side of the court when God's saying... I gave it to you. That's why a lot of times Christians blame things on God. I love this. They blame things on God that he didn't have anything to do with. Well, God did this and God did that and God did this and God's sitting up in heaven going, sin. I did. Or they, they, they turn around and they say, well, the devil did this and the devil did that. And they're giving the devil the credit and the devil's going, I did. They didn't, neither one of them had anything to do with it. It was you. It was me. 
We did it, but we blame, blame it on God. God did it. The devil did it. But when are we going to take responsibility for us? You're in 100% control. Now, whether you use it or not, that's up to you. Verse 2, look what he says. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By how? By how? By renewing of your mind. It's your mind. So you got to renew it. That you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So the responsibility factor now is placed upon you and I. It's on us. We have to do it. God told us to do it. We're to renew our minds to the word. You renew your mind or you reprogram your mind to what the Bible says and not your thought life. So he tells us to guard, in closing now, to guard our mouths and our minds. This is the first law to faith and confession. Guard your mouth and guard your mind. Now, you're going to have to put God first and not last at the end of the day. Well, pastor, I do my praying at night. Why? Well, that's, that's the best time for me. The day's over. What are you going to pray about now? The day's over. you got another day coming. Why not put God first? See, now, I'm of this persuasion. This is just me now. My belief. If the Bible tells me that I owe God 10%, when it comes to tithing, then I believe 10% of everything in my life and more belongs to Him. So I believe that I owe God 10% of my time. So if there's 24 hours in the day, and we trust the message will be a blessing to you, the announcement will give you more information how you can obtain an audio or video of the message you've just heard. Remember also that these broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers and listeners. Remember also, God loves you, we love you, and... Jesus is Lord. Praise the Lord. Put a pin right there. We trust that this message has been a blessing to you. If you would like to receive a copy of the message you have just heard, or if you would like more information about how you can receive a brochure with the list of all of Pastor Harrelson's teachings, then please call or write us. Our address is 17250 Lemon Street in Hesperia, California, 92345. Or you can call the ministry at area code 760-948-0745. Once again, our address is 17250 Lemon Street in Hesperia, California, 92345. Or you can call the ministry at area code 760-948-0745. Pastor Harrelson would like to invite you to come and join us in a live worship service. If you're visiting in or if you live in the high desert area, then please make plans now to be with us. Our address and times of services are on the screen. Remember that these television broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers and listeners. Remember, God loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord.